Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 141, recorded October 13th, 2011. AMD's bulldozer ain't knocking anything over. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, joined by the man, the myth, the legend in f actually Newark, not even Fremont, the tiny town of Newark, California. What are you doing in Newark? Uh, so close, but yet so far away from the Twit brick house, you know? Well, so like close, yet so far away. 60 miles, and at this time of night, approximately three hours to four hours <laughs> of driving. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm actually in Newark, which is outside Fremont in the San Jose area, uh, visiting with ASUS, ASUS, depending on how they get mad at me for mispronouncing it. Uh, they were basically showing off a lot of their X79 products coming up for the Sandy Bridge e-launch, but not allowed to talk or show any of that. I tried very desperately to, <laughs> to take Barbara from them to kind of show off for the show this week, but instead we uh, have some other cool things to show. But that's actually what I'm doing in town. And then this weekend, if anybody's listening live or if this goes up in time, uh, I will be at the GeForce LAN in Oakland and Alameda on the USS Hornet hosting a workshop on Saturday at 7.30 p.m. So if you're in the area, please stop by, say hello. Uh, we'd love to have you there. Woo so should we? are you allowed to show off the box you were showing off before the show? Should we start I absolutely with the, am. With the show and tell? I, I think show and tell is always a good way to start a show <laughs> and or kindergarten, right? And this, I think, fits in, in well to both. So I'm going to uh, hold this up here. You can actually look at the presentation. This is really hard to do. Um, so what we're looking at here is essentially an external DAC, digital uh, analog converter. And it's hard. It's very heavy device. Is that normal for these types of devices, Patrick? It's It's much heavier than it maybe looks on the screen. I'm not hearing any audio all of a sudden. How about now? There you go. Okay. <laughs> so the magic table buttons are on today. <laughs> they are. I'll just lean away from them. The uh, There is a huge, huge coil inside of that. Um, uh, basically, the, the power supply inside of that thing is huge. The idea is that you have much more power available than it could possibly use. Giant silver buttons, the hallmark of a company that is looking to move into the audiophile market, which actually uh, Asus and the Zonar brand has been there for a while. Stereophile Magazine put uh, Zonar's uh, PCI card or PCI Express card on the front. John Atkinson gave it a seal of approval. They're making some really nice high-end stuff. A couple interesting features on this one, along with that gigantic power supply that makes it so heavy uh, mm -hmm. and the balanced XLR outputs, is they have swappable, if I read that correctly, they are running swappable op amps inside of that. So you can actually, it's they actually designed it to make it more friendly to audio hacking. Because I know for a while, one of the big things... Um, for some serious audio tweakers was to actually upgrade all the capacitors uh, and other components on on uh, on the creative sound cards to try to give them a little better audio. But Zonar is making the Asus and the Zonar uh, branding is making some really good cards. And this is a really interesting product because they're also, um, um, yeah, I mean, there's a huge internal power supply on that. And they're saying they have enough of a, a headphone amplifier on that to comfortably drive 600 ohm headphones. So you will not need an external uh, headphone amplifier to drive this. Yeah, Replica X360, the, the I did press the red button, the jolly, shiny, candy-like button. Yeah, and the knob does look like it weighs 20 pounds alone. It's it's kind of funny. It's like a classic audiophile thing is to start going with <laughs> giant silver heavy knobs. And part of that is is when you start getting to things like really nice Alps uh, potentiometers and stuff, you end up getting some really heavy components inside of there. So I mean, in this, I mean, it has, you can look, so this are, these are input outputs. You've got the USB input, 
obviously for coming from your computer, and then you've got analog or digital, optical, and uh, uh, coax input options as well. And then um, for your output options, you've got your unbalanced stereo back here, and then you've actually got balanced XLR output as well for kind of like, uh, I guess, longer runs. More um, for audiophile nerds. Yeah, on Serious the front, you audiophile nerds. headphone amp and that I'll, kind of stuff. I'll be really was, curious to see what they're selling this for. I, I, don't, I, don't, I have no idea, to be perfectly honest with you. I, if I guess, it would really be just a guess. It does upsampling as well. I don't know what uh, your thoughts are necessarily on upsampling. They apparently have a different algorithm type for that. that is, uh, they're calling it symmetric upsampling. So they don't just kind of blanketly up convert everything to 192 kilohertz or something like right. that. They go up in multiples of four or eight, and it apparently uh, creates uh, smoother curves as opposed to jagged edges on these curves of audio um, waves and that kind of stuff. So it's a very interesting device. I have to admit, uh, it kind of falls out my um, out of my safety zone, I guess, in terms <laughs> of knowledge. That's why I wanted to make sure that when I brought this on, they let me steal this away from their office that you were on here to at least be have somewhat... Uh, of a knowledgeable discussion about it, but uh, it's supposed to be built by the end of the year, and uh, it looks nice. I mean, what would what would a consumer use this for? Who who needs this? Who wants this type of of heavy device on their desk? Well, you know, it, it probably isn't for a lot of people. It's probably not going on the desk. It's probably going on their media totem or or wherever your stereo is. Yeah, something like this is essentially a high end um, sound card. I mean. That's basically somebody who's looking for superior audio, audio processing. Um, mm -hmm. They use a, a, a headroom external dank, a, a DAC, excuse me, dank. <laughs> use an external dank, a digital audio noise, um, but in an external headphone amp because it gives me super, super clean sound, much better than the, the stuff that's on the, the motherboard. Although I have, I got to say in the last like three, four years, last five years, uh, audio on the motherboard has gotten a lot better, especially on some portables. Um, but essentially, this is a, depending on the price, this is either a high-end or an affordable device for getting better audio out of your computer. Probably you you want to step up from the audio on your motherboard or you're, you're looking for something more sophisticated, you know, with different sources. I can't quite tell all of the source options in there. Hmm. Um, oh, um, I don't know. It's like bit perfect. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, so hmm. when when you plug this in your computer, it shows up as a as an output device, as a right. sound card. When you plug it's, it into through through the USB connection, and then you can also uh, you know connect in any other kind of digital audio device as well. Yeah. To it. So yeah. Oh, it's interesting. So it's got two dedicated. So you could actually use it as a preamp. The the Asus yes. Sonar Essence One is fitted with two dedicated volume controls: one for the headphones and another for speakers. Unlike most, so basically, it's it's two volume controls. I'm still getting over that. Unlike most USB DACs, which use only one volume control for the output level of both headphone and speaker, or no volume control, the Sonar Essence One allows users to set the headphone and speaker volume levels separately. I mean, it's kind of interesting. This is the where who who's going to buy this is totally going to depend on kind of three things one the cost two mm. uh how audiophile nerds think it compares against more expensive and less expensive equipment out there and three um the cost i think is is going to be really interesting i think it's it's it, you know it's 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 something you'll lack both as a preamp um if you have a source like you could basically put it like a small notebook computer run the output from that into this and have you know build yourself your basic jukebox and i'm sure a lot of people are like can i just plug my ipod into the head unit and it's probably depending on when you bought one or if it's a uh, surround sound it's mm. interesting i, I want to see the price you know it, it can't be any worse than the logitech transporter i ended up with uh, from a buddy of mine that was selling for 1500 before logitech finally stopped making those so fortunately he lost it to me in a poker game <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Never uh, so the other, bet the uh, audio gear. Oops, sorry. The other kind of show-off item that we had here from this event, they wouldn't let me bring any of their X79 products. They're, be very, they're still being very predictive about those motherboards and platforms and features they're going to offer. But this was this was this is kind of new, not super new. Um, it, it kind of looks like your normal kind of standard Z68 motherboard. It is a Z68 socket 1155 motherboard, which means it supports Sandy Bridge processors. It also supports uh, Ivy Bridge processors when they come out next year. This is also the ASUS version of the motherboard that supports PCI Express, 
Gen 3. And uh, it will actually support it on um, two PCI Express slots, so you'll get support for SLI running PCI Express Gen uh, 3.0 as well. And it, so this one will have out-of-the-box support for Ivy Bridge, meaning you don't have to update the BIOS, you don't have to worry about anything like that. You might, you'll still want to update the BIOS, uh, obviously, when the processor is released, because it's probably not going to be until, you know, after CES or something like that at the very least. But you won't have to worry about getting a Sandy Bridge processor to make sure you can update this BIOS to have support for Ivy right. Bridge, which is always one of those uh, headaches of an issue. It's got, you know, it's got tons of uh, connectivity in there, USB 3, Bluetooth. Um, are are we going to see any benefit from P like PCI Express 3? You know, it's an interesting discussion because in theory, you're going from 16 gigabytes per second to 32 gigabytes per second of bandwidth on a... Um, PCI Express 3.0 bus, which sounds awesome at first, right? You think, whoa, that's double the bandwidth. Yeah, whoa, nobody really uses that much bandwidth is, is the concern, though. So I don't think we're going to see huge jumps in performance. If you have a high-end PCI Express-based SSD, you'll see some performance advantages. What's also interesting is that ASUS is claiming, and this is not something I've tested yet, uh, and I'm looking forward to testing it on this board or, or another one, one of the X79 boards coming out later, is that PC, when enabling PCI Express 3.0 in the BIOS will decrease the occurrences of the dreaded micro-stuttering issue with multi-GPU gaming. Mm -hmm. In theory, because the latency is reduced on PCI Express 3.0 as well. So not only do you get a bandwidth increase, but you get a latency reduction as well. So um, they're, they, ha they have reported seeing reductions in stuttering in games uh, like Bad Company 2 and others when just switching between the same motherboard, same platform, same graphics card, switching between PCIe 2.0 mode and PCIe 3.0 mode in the BIOS. So that will be kind of interesting to see. Uh, if that pans out, that might be a reason for us to push the... You know, adoption of PCI Express 3.0, whereas currently it's a nice feature and it's a good kind of check mark uh, on on whatever board you buy, but it doesn't really appear to be offering much in the immediate time span. So you always get the new spec before you get anything can actually take advantage of it. Yeah. Now that we've talked about the shiny and the excitement, let us talk about the disappointment and the general miasma of shame that AMD coverage has turned into. I'm exaggerating, actually. It seems like a really nice processor, except that it's pretty much running like a slower Core i5. Uh, is, yeah. Is that the cold, hard truth about Bulldozer? It is. It is. Uh, you know, we came in with a lot of excitement about this part. We've talked about Bulldozer forever on, the, on Twitch, and we've talked about motherboards getting support ready for this processor. And unfortunately, this was kind of something I knew about a month ago, right. more or less, when I went to AMD. And they don't come out and say, hey, our processor is not going to be very good. But you can tell the way they present benchmark performance results of their own or lack thereof. You have a good idea of where things are going to stand. And the same thing happened here. It's, it's an eight-core processor, but it's not eight true cores. It's uh, four modules, each that has two cores in it. It's, it's not like hyperthreading. It's more than hyperthreading, but it's a not quite eight individual cores. Mm -hmm. uh, it's basically each, each module has two sets of integer function units, but they share a floating point function unit. So you get, uh, in my performance testing, you get about 65 to 66% scaling uh, or utilization of, uh, of those two cores, right? So if you have a, a perfectly threaded application and you do it on one thread on that module, you get, you know, 1.0 performance. And if you run two threads on that same module, you will get 1.65 performance. Right. Whereas if you run it on core one and core two separate modules, you'll get close to 2.0 performance, right? right. So it's right. not quite... Uh, eight cores, although they're billing it, of course, as the world's first desktop eight core processor. You know, it's it doesn't catch up. It catches up to Sandy Bridge better than Phenom 2 does, mm -hmm. but it's it's more in line with a Core i5-2500 right. and maybe uh, averaging a little bit below that, and it's not really coming close in, 
in anything but a couple of select, select instances to the 2600, which is the top end Sandy Bridge part. And keep in mind that Ivy, you know, we're already talking about Ivy Bridge release. We're looking at Ivy Bridge ready motherboards. We're looking at, you know, right. X79 platforms or Sandy Bridge E, AMD. Even if you, even if you str go out on the limb and say, this allowed them to kind of catch up to Sandy Bridge, they're kind of catching up to Sandy Bridge just weeks yeah. before Sandy Bridge E comes out and takes it another step further. And, and so. months before Ivy Bridge itself comes out. I, I, I had a question about the, the, the review, actually, Chad was posting it a second ago. Um, the the mm. performance mm. per dollar page on mm. that, you know, top one on the chart there, performance per dollar, Cinebench 10. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, it's like 84.40 uh, versus like a Core i5 2500K Sandy Bridge, which is running like 93.23. I'm assuming more is better on that chart? Yes, on that particular chart, higher is better because you are talking about performance results per dollar. Right. So I think on all of those, yeah. So it's on that particular result, it's uh, Cinebench CPU marks, which is just some incremental score that they give you per dollar. Mm -hmm. If you look at Euler, which is kind of like a, a, a high-level synthetic and, you know, kind of HPC type workload. It's hertz per dollar. Handbrake is frames per second per dollar. Um, it's it's not a bad deal in terms of that, in terms of your right. value per dollar. Uh, but in terms of performance per watt, it's really bad. It um, you know it uses it uses all 130 watts of its TDP. Ooh. You know, to to be to be perfectly honest with you. So if you look at performance per watt page, it's not it's not great. Um, the issue is is the performance per dollar is very close to Sandy Bridge, mm -hmm. and the total cost is close as well. You know, it's one of those things. AMD likes to mill this as this processor is built for the future applications. This, this processor is built for applications that know how to use multi-threading to their absolute maximum. And if you look at the results in Handbrake or Pavre, you see that to be the case. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, you know, the Valve particle test, it actually, if you look at its performance per, do, its, or performance per dollar, it's below all of the Sandy Bridge processors, right. even the most expensive Sandy Bridge processor. Um, <laughs> And it's well below AMD's own Phenom 2 X6 processor, the right. Thuban, the, the, the six core, six real cores on that processor. If anything, what this has shown me is there's a sale on the launch day of Bulldozer for the Phenom 2 X6 that put that processor at like $160, the, the Phenom 2 X6, six core CPU for like 160 bucks. That would have been, to me... The CPU to buy, if you're an AMD fan, you have one of these AM3 uh, socket mud boards ready to go and you're looking for something to put in there. I, it's, I don't know, it's, it's not an awful part, but people were expecting so much more. They, peop, you know, it would have been a great part a year ago. Yeah, yeah, it would have been a much better part a year ago. And it's just, it's one of those things where it, you can tell that this part was built for the server workloads, this part was built for high performance computing and, and, and those types of things. And it's just not, it's just not where it needs to be. Keep in mind this, this is a 2 billion transistor CPU, 2 billion. Sandy bridge is like 1.1 billion mm -hmm. and a third of that or so 25% of that. So let's say 800 million transistors are outperforming this 2 billion transistor chip right. pretty handily. And that's not good So for efficiency. While we're talking about efficiency, or, or in this case, lack thereof, yeah. they, this also reminds me of, of, it's kind of funny, somebody's asking me, like, why aren't there more Lano reviews? And I'm like, well, there's not a lot to review. Um, PCPro.com last week, or, or, or about 10 days ago now, old Lano, wherefore art thou? Um, Global Foundries making the chips for Lano. Are they also making the bulldozer chips? Yep. Because it, yep. it seems that Global Foundries, basically the, the gist of the article is that the yields are not spectacular mm -hmm. um, coming out of Global Foundries. So, you know, there, there are some supply issues as graphically illustrated by the, the picture of the <laughs> empty shelves there. Excellent, excellent, cruel, but excellent yeah. color choice. Yeah, we um, do what we can. You know, basically, what's the what's the line from their uh, supply of AMD's Lino APUs affected by Global Foundry's lower than expected 32 nanometer yield rates has been significantly limited and is unlikely to recover until the company's upcoming Trinity arrives in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's just looking like a tough you know and it's kind of funny because like you know you start looking over you know uh, uh you know a couple days ago uh you guys had the uh the micro uh, uh itx lano motherboards in there um mm -hmm. that were linked through and it's kind of amazing like i'm looking at this and I'm thinking like what an amazing part like those things are like six inches oh the mini itx motherboards yeah, yeah. or those nine inch boards uh i don't really know the numeric by probably nine um it's kind of funny i don't, can't believe i don't remember like i have no idea what the spec is uh apparently we're getting old <laughs> quick i will turn like, to the yeah. internet because mm, mm. i remember I mean, mini itx is actually smaller than micro Hold on. yes yes mini itx is the smallest um it is a <sighs> So what's interesting? Six point seven by six point seven inches. Yes. There you go. <laughs> you you win. You win. The, the supply issue really becomes because think remember Lano is processing cores and GPU cores. The issue is this is the first time Global Foundries has done any GPU cores mm -hmm. for AMD. Bulldozer doesn't have GPU cores, so we're right. not really sure if uh, yield is going to be affected in the same way as Lano. Uh, or on bulldozer as it is on Lano, it, it really kind of depends on. It still does still on 32 nanometer process, but it's you know up in the air on whether or not they will actually be able to do that. And the other issue is are, how many how many are they going to sell in a market that we're at today? You know, consumer desktop world being what it is, how many can it actually hope to sell? Hmm. So, Aviator Direct. You did a system evaluation, $1,000 mm -hmm. gaming system. They challenged you to build, basically use their storefront to build a $1,000 mm -hmm. PC and see how it stands up to a $1,000 machine you would have built yourself. How did Ava well, do that? Well, I don't think... I, well, oh, I, they definitely didn't want us to do like a direct, direct <laughs> comparison, but of course we have to include that, right? So for $1,080, we built a system with a with a you know a good mid tower chassis, 500 watt power supply, a P67 motherboard. This was um, right as the Z68 kind of platforms were coming mm -hmm. out. Uh, Core i5, 2400, four gigs of memory, a 6950 graphics card, which is nice, terabyte hard drive, Blu-ray drive, Windows 7. Uh, and a warranty for 1080 bucks. Now, one of the things, we had several people in the comments on that story comment and say, hey, I was able to build this on Newegg for $706. And um, yes, but you have like to that. do the cable management yourself. I have, I have an entire Google Plus thread talking about cable management. And I'm uh, the thing is, I don't think these guys included Windows. Really? They're just so used, I think they're just so used to like getting quote Windows for free uh, that they forget <laughs> that's another you know an, an OEM has to include that that's another ninety nine bucks so now you're talking you're still talking about a two hundred dollar premium for the AVA Direct system but you get three year warranty parts labor and that kind of stuff the system performed well and somebody else did the cable management which is you know <laughs> obviously critical to me as I'm looking at the beautiful cable like how, I, I, yeah we'll talk about that thread in the next couple of weeks as I finish sorting yeah. through all the ideas but it's it's sometimes really nice to have somebody else build a system for you vet a system for you and you don't have to deal with scrounging parts and getting them together a, and having 42 boxes in your house exactly uh, it's a different type of consumer right there right. are people um, who transition in their lives let's take patrick for example maybe you're at a point now where you've got uh you've got a kid you've got a toddler it's a lot of work taking care of a toddler you've got a <laughs> wife you've got a house you're trying to take care of you want a game you want to play battlefield 3 and you want to do it right but but damn it you just want somebody else to, to do make all the decisions for you right and so we go one step at pc perspective with the hardware leaderboard we take as much of the decision process out and say here's what we think you should get and then you can go another step further if you want and go to a system builder like ava direct uh, or you know there's tons of other ones that offer systems in the same type of price range that can get you up and running and you know as little as hassle as possible and then we i think patrick and i both realize that the majority of our listeners want to do this themselves and we encourage that but if you don't, there are other options out there. So Sometimes it's okay to trade a swipe of the credit card for time and convenience. Yes, very much so. <laughs> R&B Mods uh, has a, a review of StarTech.com kind of device. Uh, uh, we've seen certainly at the high end and used for computer forensics. It is a portable eSATA USB to SATA standalone HD duplicator dock, which is not going to win any prizes for it being an absolutely cool name, but it's pretty much... Yep. Uh, you know, what's on the, uh, 
what's on the uh, outside of the can is what's inside the box, box? there. I'm trying to pull it. Sorry, yeah. the, the, there it goes. Um, and it's actually amazing. What's kind of impressive about this is... Oh, wait, I take that back. That's a link. Sorry, I'm looking at an advertisement link for a uh, USB 2.0 uh, to SATA cable adapter. I was like, wow, $32 for a drive duplicator? That's incredible. How did they... Oh, that's not the right price. Yeah, I can't get the review from the RB Mod site to, to load for me right now. But the idea is... I just put this in there because I have never actually used one of these devices mm -hmm. and I was very close to buying one yesterday when I saw this or two days ago. And it's just, I do a lot of drive duplication right. at PC Perspective. So you just basically plug in a SATA drive on one side, you plug in a SATA drive on the other, you plug it into the wall, you hit go, and it copies the data. The, the issue is there's a lot of questions involved. What happens if you have different size drives? What happens if you have... Um, unique boot records and partitions. Uh, right. It's not as fast as if you hooked it up to a computer and, and used some piece of software like Norton's Ghost or right. uh, all the other, you know, the other ones that are out there and that kind of deal. But for convenience sake, it seems pretty nice. Have you ever used something like this? Uh, I have used uh, similar devices about a thousand years ago. Um, mm. Back in the... Uh, uh, when it was essentially a computer-sized device that you plugged in. <laughs> um, but, yeah, this is incredible. 52 bucks Prime on Amazon, direct from StarTech. Uh, so far, there is one mm. customer review on Amazon.com. Okay. And four stars, okay device. The manual is wrong. The on switch is on the side of the dock, not on the power supply, as stated in the manual. It was so small and hard to see that I missed it and ended up, obviously, the power switch was a traumatic experience. Just remember, it will only duplicate drives where the source and destination hard disk drives are of the same size or where the destination drive is bigger. Seems reasonable. Not good for cloning your OS fair. to an SSD, which is usually 10 times smaller than the source. It is good True. for duplicating Mac OS drives, which have a bootloader on another partition, which is not seen. So basically, it's, it's doing a, a, a sector by sector copy. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Um at 50 bucks, dude, that is ridiculously cheap for what this is. If, yeah. With shipping. I, yeah, yeah, I like that. I, 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 now, that, now that I know that review says that it will do larger sizes as well. I mean, that's totally fair. I guess one of the issues you run into is you might get two drives that say 750 gigs. Maybe right. they're not identical models. And one of them is just a little bit smaller, like a couple of kilobytes because of the way they partitioned it or something. And um, you get all the way to the end of the process and it doesn't work, you know, something like that. But then you, do your you get what you can do. You get partition editor and you change the partition on the drive you're copying from to a smaller drive space. <laughs> See, then, then we're not easy again. And I want easy. Well, speaking of easy, uh, H40 budget water cooler coming out from Corsair. How did it hold up? I like the idea of still no reviews yet, okay. but yeah, it's 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 like their new low cost option, fifty nine bucks. That's cheap. For yeah, yeah, it, it, they don't have. have a, I, I Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we've lost the internet connection to Mr. Shrout's computer. Pretty good, a little bit. Oh, there he goes. You might I like to catch up. <laughs> that was really amazing because you were like, e ah, er, ah, and then it blurbed out like seven words uh, in under a second. Did, uh, did we get to the part about it having an aluminum bottom? No. Like, I think they got rid of the copper and went to an aluminum base plate, which is where they saved some money. That would do it. And aluminum is actually, while not nearly as thermally efficient at, uh, at moving heat as copper, is still pretty darn functional at mm -hmm. the part. 59 bucks is super cheap for a water cooler. Now I want to see them do a universal sort of GPU adapter so we could have like a $59 GPU cooler. <laughs> or yeah, that would be silly. nice. No, no, it's nice to dream things. <laughs> Ultralight Fusion Notebook, do you want to talk about the MSI's new ultra portable chassis, or should we skip right on to the uh, UEFI BIOS? Or yeah, let's just skip UEFI? on that. I'll, we'll just mention MSI, the X370 review. It's a Fusion-based notebook, it kind of considered an ultra portable. We have a review of that over at PC Per if you're interested in that. But, yeah, I think, uh, what, what is this comment you were making on the EV, UEFI BIOS looking like? 
Eufy coming down the road. It's, well, it, it looks, uh, the, the Eufy BIOS utility looks exactly like the BIOS utility that is in the motherboard I'm using for my home server. My completely over-the-top Core i5 home server and Blu-ray ripper. Um, but yeah, it looks exactly like the, the, uh, the, the, that BIOS looks almost exactly like the BIOS on my Asus P8867M. So... It it's pretty close. I think they might have had this this iteration of the UEFI mm -hmm. in that motherboard. Um, it's still definitely UEFI. UEFI. Well, that's really hard to say. Yuffie. Um, <laughs> okay, we'll go with that. It, I mean, ASUS was the first company to really um, put it on all of their motherboards. I, I think mm -hmm. they put it on almost all of their Sandy Bridge motherboards. So that might explain why it looks so familiar to you. Um, but we are saying MSI and Gigabyte follow suit. And actually, you know, like the first iteration from MSI was really, really bad. It was just clunky and, and, mm -hmm. and, and had a lot of non-functional parts. But they've fixed a lot of that with their most recent motherboards. We posted a review today at PC Pro of the MSI uh, Z68 GD80 board, also a Gen 3 PCI Express 3.0 board, but it has their new version of the BIOS. And it's very nice. Um, I think you asked a question in the news notes about what is the benefit of this, mm -hmm. except that it looks nicer. Yeah, well, it was it was one of the things in the in the comments was the Eufy BIOS um, get you a little bit closer to the metal. And I was wondering if that's in the sense that it, it allows you more control or at a deeper level on the BIOS. Because it's funny because you get this big that big visual interface and it lets you know what mm -hmm. your, you know your what temperature your CPU is running at what your voltage is at you can adjust your boot order in there and then you go in the upper right hand corner and you click and then boom all of a sudden you're in a traditional looks like every other ugly ass bios i've used for the last 10 years bios um, you can see exit advanced mode and and then it looks like every other bios with all the 42000 settings in there it's true um, you know I don't exactly know why we needed to move to this. We needed to move to this because you can do unique things with user interfaces that you couldn't right. do. Keep in mind that all previous BIOSes were basically emulating DOS software. <laughs> so anything you wanted to do, tabs, right. uh, uh, any, any, any post-booting uh, materials or, or um, options and that kind of thing, were all done essentially in like a 1998 Linux installer right. style format, right? And this this was just an improvement in user interface. You can use a mouse now, although I don't necessarily think that's any better. The access to UFEI also helps software in Windows interact with the settings on the motherboard. So mm -hmm. it does kind of help you get closer to the metal kind of in that way. And like uh, if you look at the ASUS software that comes with your motherboards, it can much more easily now interact with and change settings on the fly. And you'll especially see that in the upcoming X79 boards from ASUS and others where the overclocking software in Windows is essentially as good as anything you'll be able to get in the BIOS. And, uh, you know, you don't have to reboot your machine and there's all kinds of advantages uh, to that type of stuff now. So It's interesting. Uh, one of the things that... Uh uh, the reviewer uh, uh, Jeff Gassier up at the Tech Report talks about is is how horrendous because what's funny about the uh, and I'm going to try to say the entire name without swallowing my own tongue. They just tighten up my braces, so they're pulling my teeth back together. <laughs> So if I look like I'm in pain, it's because I am. The unified extensible firmware interface, and and one of the things one of the things he points out is that how many poor implementation of mouse behavior there are in that, mm -hmm. and that's one of the big deals about that is is being able to actually use your mouse and not just your keyboard when you're playing around with your BIOS settings. So. Yeah, the acceleration's all off, and it differs from screen to screen in some yeah. cases. I, I all the motherboards we have now use that. I still don't use a mouse. It's still easier to use the arrow keys, use the tab buttons. Um, you don't like using the giant triangle and dragging it to one corner for performance and one corner Windows for energy 3 saving? <laughs> Windows 3.0. Windows uh, 3.0 interface style. No, I, I, the keyboards just work, and I tend to like things that just work work. Speaking of just working, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a moment to thank the fine sponsor that helps us bring Twitch to you this week and source of much late night entertainment at my house, Netflix. Uh, that's right, Netflix, uh, the company that will stream you thousands of TV episodes and movies instantly, whether or not it's any time of the day. It doesn't have to be in the middle of the night like Patrick is kind of insinuating here. Uh, the benefits of this is you save a lot of time, you save a lot of money, 
you save a lot of hassle. You don't have to worry about returning DVDs or Blu-rays to a, to, a, to a box at a grocery store, to a rental store, if you can still have those. Uh, what's great about Netflix is you can watch movies and TV shows on your Mac, your PC, your iPad, on your iPhone. Uh, a lot of Android phones now support the Netflix streaming applications. If you have a game console like an Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, Nintendo Wii, you can watch Netflix on there, Roku boxes, uh, the Apple TV, those and many other devices support Netflix streaming, and it's, and it's really nice. Um, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of those devices. You can begin watching a movie or show on one device. This is actually really cool. And finish it on a different one. So if, uh, like, say I'm done with Twitch recording here and I've got some free time before I'm supposed to go out to dinner, I can pull up Netflix and start watching an episode. If dinner gets really boring, I can pull out my phone and say, to hell with you people, I'm going to finish watching this episode of uh, whatever miscellaneous TV show you happen to be watching at the time. Maybe not the most polite thing to do, but you have that option. Uh, <laughs> Whichever way you choose to access Netflix and however you do it and whenever you do it and wherever you do it, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want, anytime you want. You can watch each episode. You can watch the same episode of a kid's program over and over and over and over again, which is really handy if you have toddlers and you need to keep them distracted while, say, you paint the walls or something like that. I wouldn't know. I don't have any, but it sounds like something Patrick would have had to have gone through at least somewhat recently. <laughs> Uh, if you you know, and, and you you can try it out. It's completely free. If you're not happy with it, you can cancel it any time. Uh, and you've got to like that kind of of confidence that a company has in their own product. So go to Netflix.com/slash/twit and be sure to use that URL when you sign up for the trial. Netflix.com/slash/twit helps you out, helps us out. We appreciate you guys for it. We thank Netflix for their support of this week in computer hardware and the entire this week in tech network. And we hope you enjoy watching instantly. With Netflix, woohoo! I was actually enjoying uh, Angel last night. That my wife swung into Bones before I went back to the house <laughs> to clean up. Uh, I, I actually have five gallons Damn. of primer in the back of my truck right now. Um, See, I was close. I was just <laughs> guessing, but I, I I have a good sense of these things. You do have a good sense of these things. Oh, <laughs> uh, Eliza, Eliza. That's a tough name, sir. My apologies, or ma'am. Eliza has a question about notebook GPUs. How important is a video card? You know, hold on, hold on, hold on, Patrick. Hold on, hold on. I think we answered this question last week. I'm so sorry. And I think that's my fault. I think I accidentally inc kept this one in from the show notes. How about um, Keith talking about we, non we did not We did not address that All one, right. no. <laughs> Keith calls in with a question about non-reference HD 6990 cards. He says, love the podcast. Very informative. Thank you, Keith. He says, I have a specific need for high-end GPU to run data ton watch out for live multi-screen and ultra-wide blended projection for higher-end corporate meeting work. One requirement for our video cards is locking connectors, so DVI and display port are what we look for. I fell in love with the Asus EAH6970. I'm going to skip right over the rest of that 42 digits. Given it's two, uh -huh. DVI, two DVI and four DP outputs, it's a great car, but we'd like to get more power. I've noticed that only reference versions of the HD6990 are available. Not horrible, but the lack of locking connectors is a non-starter on top of not having six discrete outputs. Six discrete screens is the maximum I can drive from a single computer. What is your sense if the manufacturers will be putting out their own versions, specifically a card with equivalent outputs, to the Asus EAH6970? I know in the past you talked about the scarcity of the 6970 chip and that manufacturers would rather use it on 6970 cards instead of two for the 6990. Is that what's holding this back or something else? Oh, boy. Um, you're, you're doomed. Um, I say that with love and affection, but... You you are a special interest consumer. You have you know what I mean like needing you wanting six locking connectors on a single GPU is something mm -hmm. that's going to get harder and harder and harder to do because the entire and more expensive. Yeah, because basically manufacturers want to use that I you know I display link is the the answer to a problem nobody had except for people that want to build really tiny notebooks and GPU vendors that want to cram more ports onto a single notebook so for your locking connector you may end up having to do something like you know designing a device that allows you to lock the connectors in externally with an attachment to the machine but this mm. is the future 
uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, this and HDMI for a lot of devices out there. And that doesn't even get into the whole 6970, 6990 issue. <laughs> right. It, well, that's my thing is I don't know what Data 10 Watch Out does. Uh, I've never heard of that piece of software before. But he wants to move from a 6970, which is the highest performance single GPU card from AMD, right. to the 6990, which is a dual GPU um, card. What's interesting to me is I don't, unless he's doing 3D rendering, you're not going to get any additional performance for simply multi-display configurations out of a 6990. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe data to watch out software does a lot of 3D stuff. I really have no well, idea if it does. Data to watch out would be used if, if, if it's kind of like if you're doing, if, if you, you go to a trade show, they have 42 monitors on the set and somebody's mm -hmm. in the back controlling all the audio and video feeds. Data to watch out basically okay. allows you to do, um, coordinate multiple displays and organize the output on those. It really just doesn't sound like ways. GPU horsepower is an issue there. What it sounds like is yeah. output. Connectivity is, is an option. And in, ter in terms of consumer class graphics cards with consumer prices, six displays is the best you're going to get. Right. And I don't think moving to a 6990 with six displays is going to be any better. Why not add a second 6970 and you get six more displays out of it? Uh, I, you know, I don't... You're not going to see, I guess the, the, the end of the answer is you're not going to see any non-reference 6990 cards right. because they're too... They don't sell enough. Designers aren't going to build specific things like that. You know, the closest we got was like the Asus Mars 2, which was a dual GTX 580 mm -hmm. card. And I think it only has four display outputs. But if, right. if for whatever reason you need GPU horsepower in a single card, that is the card to look to if you could find it for $1,400 somewhere. <laughs> um, but if it's, if I don't think, I don't think you're moving to a crossfire configuration on the same number of displays is going to help you any with this particular workload. Right. So uh, we have an update from Gareth. I think it was two weeks ago we had a RAID question from him. Maybe it was last week. We wanted to, he wanted to, he had a RAID array that a motherboard that had died and he wanted to put another motherboard in and hopefully recover all the data off of that RAID array. And I believe at the time, Patrick, we said, mm, you really need to find as close to an identical motherboard as possible. Otherwise, you run the risk of having some issues. But he sent us this update, and I thought it was good information that we could pass Great on. Great information. He says he has an update for the effort. He went with the ASUS P8Z68V Pro mm -hmm. with an Intel Core i5-2500K. I believe his previous motherboard was uh, um, an ICH9, mm -hmm. so an older generation platform completely. The Z68 recognized my RAID 1.0, RAID 10, array once I configured the SATA ports as RAID. Interestingly, Windows booted right into it. Think about the massive environment change that the OS saw. Anyway, <laughs> he recovered everything and did the full system rebuild using a new single one terabyte drive from Seagate. Thanks for the support, the show, and your reviews that got me back in business. That is awesome news. So that's, that's actually, it gives you hope if you have the same type of thing. If you have like a, a Linfield platform that has a RAID array that, and the motherboard goes out on you, it sounds like it's possible we're not guaranteeing anything. We never do on this show. Uh, that <laughs> you can no, swap that's not true. We, we always what? guarantee if you wait, you'll be able to get more power for less money. Or okay. the same yeah. power for yeah. less money. Yeah. Or more power uh, for like the same swap money. Swap that platform out, and you might have a chance of recovering your data without a lot of hassle. Right. So that's, that's good info. Larry's got a question about our Battlefield 3 upgrade and show 139, the BF3 show. You referenced my single 460 and said it would be okay for low to maybe medium settings. So here's the $64,000 question. Would, it's expensive. Yeah. It's, hopefully you just buy an a arcade for that money. Would two 460s be as good as a single 5,000 card upgrade? And would I really be happy on dual 24-inch monitors? Um... Dual 24-inch monitors. Is that Dual really going to be an advantage for Battlefield? I'm, I'm just not feeling Battlefield 3 is, is being multiple monitor love. Not yeah, with I two, also, that's for sure. Maybe three yeah. because you've got one in the center and two on the side. If you've got right. two, your crosshairs are right where those two bezels meet. And I cannot imagine that being a great gaming experience mm -hmm. at all. 
period. So stick um, to the single 24-inch monitor or go with the 30-inch monitor if you've got the coin. Or buy another 24-inch monitor and go with three if you're going to sell high anyway. Um, his question about, you know, will a, a single 460 be enough? Interestingly, we did this exact test on PC Per. If you go to uh, a story called Battlefield 3 Beta Performance, mm -hmm. Quality Preset, and SLI Scaling, we look at specifically SLI scaling with the GTX 460. And we found that the GTX 460 on high settings uh, was able to go from... 33 frames per second to 62 frames per second, which is like really close to layer scaling. And it was really impressive. And I think 33 frames per second on a high, high action, high paced kind of action shooter is not going to be an ideal situation for you. 62 right. frames per second, much better. And you can get that without having to upgrade your whole platform, adding in a second graphics card. Um, now, again, this was at 1920 by 1200, a single screen single resolution if you're going to do three displays it's not going to work if you're going to do two displays it's not going to work right when we recommended a system for triple panel gaming in battlefield 3 it was a pair of gtx 580s <laughs> so keep that in mind when uh when looking at uh setting up your game i think i think you're better off if, if you don't want to buy another monitor go with a single display and you know i for SLI continues to impress me, right? I mean, the scaling performance you get, not in every game, but in a lot of games, continues to impress me this late. You know, the 460 is a pretty old card, so you think, not really old, but it's it's previous generation. You can get them relatively inexpensive. I think maybe $160 now mm -hmm. to double your performance in a game is, is, is a nice boost. It's a happy thought. Should, we'll probably just skip right over Rage since I'm afraid that uh, Kyle from Hard ACP will drop out of the ceiling and beat me to death for mentioning it. Um, he's very unhappy about having purchased <laughs> Don't Rage. Don't do that. Yes, no. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you were talking about a follow-up. We had a, a question from a, a viewer asking about Skyrim and whether he should upgrade his CPU or his GPU first. Yes. Um, I don't, we got this question and I was like, I was very intrigued by it because I wouldn't know this information too. The mm -hmm. problem is, is I don't know the answer. Uh, Skyrim, I haven't been able to sit down and play with. Bethesda's role-playing games will be very GPU intensive, but they are also are of the lot that they will be CPU intensive as well, more so than most PC games. Um, I still would think for Skyrim, what's going to be most important for the best kind of gaming improvement is going to be a graphics card, but uh, we'll know more soon, I hope. That game gets released on November 11th, so less than a month away, and I'm supposed to be getting an early copy soon uh, to do some testing, of course, um, <laughs> and uh, we'll, know, we'll know more then. And once again, Ryan ruins a game for his own personal enjoyment just so you can have the hardware information. <laughs> I'm ruining it. And you, everybody needs to feel sorry for me then. There you go. Aiden has a question about using a TV as a monitor. The age-old debate continues. He says, I have a gaming PC and a 23-inch LED monitor, which works great. But I'm just about to buy a 42-inch HDTV, LCD, plasma, LED. It doesn't really matter. However, it has to be a TV, not a monitor, his emphasis, as I plan to use it for a lot of HDMI products. Anyways, before I buy the TV, I want to get a bit of advice and know what I should be looking out for when buying one that will work well with the HDMI port of my XFX HD 6970. I presume it's the hertz of the TV I should be taking interest in. I have lots of LCD TVs in the past, hook up to laptops, and even my current gaming rig through HDMI and just not look right. E.g., when you look at icons on the desktop, you can clearly see the pixels are a little blurred. This might not seem like much, but when I'm surfing the web with black writing and a white <laughs> background, it does get very annoying. I agree. Especially it's yes. also if you lose the entire sort of toolbar or half your desktop off the bottom of the screen. <laughs> I assume this is due to these TVs only doing 60 hertz. No, it is not. I say assume, but I'm not sure if this is true. This is a bit of guesswork from myself. If you could help me out, that would be great. Below is a link of the TV I'm currently looking at. Being able to play games on it is not essential. Can my 6970 handle games on a 42-inch screen? One last thing, I'm having issues using the DVI port and HDMI port to have dual screen set up. I asked friends about this, and he once said it wasn't possible to use these two ports at the same time. Is there any truth to this? Question mark, question mark, question mark. So, um... One of the the nightmares of uh, uh, of especially the the first couple of generations of HDTVs was that a lot of them overscanned. Overscanning is a 
uh, engineering process from the bad old analog CRT days where they basically mm -hmm. um, wanted to make sure you didn't have any nasty black edges at the side of the screen between the edge of the television and the end of the picture. So they created a larger picture and they blew the larger picture out to the side of the CRT. The, the, the scanning gun would paint it farther than they knew where the edge of the screen would be. Which is great. It's fabulous. It's analog. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's completely <laughs> expletive useless on digital technology. Mm. Um, and for example, if you own, like I do, a, a, a 37 inch HP HD TV that was on sale at Best Buy the day before you left for the Baja 1000, when your wife said if she didn't have a functioning TV, she would divorce you before you came back from Mexico. A couple weeks later, when you're trying to get the delete expletive uh, Mac Mini to display properly on it, you find out there is no per-pixel mapping inside the HDTV, and you have to do strange and unfortunate things to make your screen fit and end up with pixels or basically icons that are the wrong side, yada, yada, yada. Most of the time, this is over. They'll either be like a one-for-one -one pixel or per-pixel mapping. Um, uh, GPUs these days, especially with Windows 7 and the latest version of OS 10s, they actually understand that there are some weird HDTV-specific resolutions out there, um, and they make it very free. You know, first of all, you make sure it's a true 1080p monitor, right? So it's 1920 by 1080. Then you make sure your output on your graphics, your GPU, is set to 1920 by 1080. The great thing about 1080p monitors is they may be huge, but compared to, you know, it's it's basically the same number of pixels or even less than a business class uh, 1080p or excuse me a business class 24 inch flat panel uh, desktop flat panel um, I would say even in terms of high-end gaming the 6970 should be in pretty good shape shouldn't it Ryan yeah I think so yeah I mean that's that's more than enough graphics card for that resolution um, it's, it's kind of funny. Also, I hammer on this because uh, Robert Heron, one of my co-hosts on Techzilla, uh, it drives him absolutely nuts that a lot of uh, overscan is turned on from the factory on a lot of HCTVs. Hmm. And it, it's something he's been on the warpath for for several years. But basically, make sure the overscan's turned off or make sure per-pixel mapping. is basically want to make sure the HCTV is displaying its native resolution on every pixel on the flat panel. That'll take care of the weird shapes and stuff. Make sure your GPU is set for the right setting. Um, Generally speaking, though, your DVI port and your HDMI port should work at the same time. However, HDMI locked content is not going to display on the DVI port if it's already displaying on an HDMI port. Um, HDCP, HDCP lock content, unless you are running it to an HDCP monitor and then things get squirrely because I'm not sure how a GPU handles, if it can even do multiple HDCP locked content over multiple I think it outputs. can. Okay. I think it can. Uh, any graphics card today should be able to do HDMI and DVI. If you're only doing two displays, if you're doing two displays, any any you know the 6970 has no problem with that, and any kind of modern NVIDIA or AMD GPU can definitely do two GPUs that way. Um, yeah, it, it gets a little bit more mundane because of the HDCP issue. It's like I'm kind of glad I almost don't watch a lot of Blu-rays anymore because I don't have to worry about that. Uh, hardly at all, um, especially on the PC side. But uh, that that could be causing an issue if that's if that's what he's trying to do. But otherwise, I mean, it's shouldn't be an issue. There you go. Uh, so what are you talking yeah. about on the? Oops. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, what are you going to be talking about at the uh, on the Hornet at seven thirty on Saturday night? So we're actually going to have a really cool event. I think we're going to talk. It's it's a co-sponsored EA. Battlefield 3 and NVIDIA type of event. So we are going to focus on building systems for Battlefield 3. I know. Go figure, right? We're going to build, I think, a system for around $600, a system for around $1,200, and then a system for around $2,000. Um, and, and kind of say, here's what kind of performance you get at each of those system rigs. And then the best part, we're going to give them away. We're going to give away all three computers. So uh, if you want your chance at that goodness, make sure you come by. Uh, even if you don't have a land spot, I think you can still get tickets to come and, 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 and look around the exhibitor area and, and go to the events, go to things like our workshop and that kind of deal. Um, we also have a lot of video cards, like just bare video cards that we're going to hand out, some 570s, maybe some 580s. I think we even have some 480s, if people like the classics, uh, <laughs> to give out as well. So it, it should be a lot of fun. And uh, definitely love to see as many of you guys out there as uh, as possible. Woohoo! And 
you were just talking about Techzilla and your you and your co-host, multiple co-hosts. Uh, what do you guys have coming up this week? Um, we are actually going to do on Monday our 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 attempt to put together the list, the definitive list, the first geek tools you should buy, sort of a, the first hundred dollars you spend on geek tools for making things work and fixing things. What should be in your toolbox, or in my case, tool bag? <laughs> I like that. I like that. Hopefully it'll it'll be it's been funny it's another one I started a, a Google Plus thread on watching people respond to uh, and and sometime in the hopefully none too distant future I will finish reading through the like 200 odd suggestions <laughs> on cable routing which are amazing and I'm actually like researching through each of these entries as I go and I will That's figure out resource. how to make the cables inside the server I just built look more pretty what's that David Sedaris book me talk pretty one day it'll be me have pretty cables someday because it was funny I like had this machine and it's like I don't have to run any of the fans in the box I all I have is a CPU fan and and the fan and the power supply barely comes on even when it's ripping video and it's so quiet and it's I'm nice. looking inside and I'm like I'm really embarrassed that I held up this mess of, it looks like a rat <laughs> just had a gigantic crack addled party inside the case and i'm like partially because there's you know there's there's four and about to be uh i'm about to to uh the operating system is installed on one of 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 four three terabyte drives and i'm about to put the operating system on an ssd um just because it's there and then run the uh basically have 12 terabytes of storage completely available um, rather than wasting some of my storage drive for for the operating system um but yeah, it's uh, cable management is driving me insane. <laughs> so that that'll be something I tackle later. Um, once I find my stock of zip ties after the move, that that's a big nice. moment in my heat shrink tubing collection, which has gotten kind of ridiculous. <laughs> so we should probably call it a show. You uh, are you heading up to Alameda tomorrow? I'm heading up in the morning tomorrow, so I will uh, finish up a couple of stories I got to do here, pack up the bags, get ready to go. I am not staying on the boat. There are people, I, did I tell you this already? There are people staying on the boat, like in the bunks, using the showers, uh, eating at the mess hall. Um, it sounds very cool. Like I would love to do it, but probably not. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like, that sounds like something neat to be able to tell people that you did. Right. However, it sounds really uncomfortable <laughs> actually, for that two-day span. I'll tell you what, it's a lot more comfortable on an aircraft carrier, even a 40s vintage aircraft carrier, than mm. it is on a submarine. <laughs> that's true. I Bubble bet that is very hardcore, true. Bubble hardcore, man. Just ask unless I get to Unless I get to go out on a ride on a plane, I probably don't want to do that. <laughs> there are some shiny actually there are a couple of amazing planes uh, in the Hornet you'll enjoy that part oh yeah oh yeah that is it for this week of Twitch this week in computer hardware I'm Patrick Norton I'm Ryan Schrout until next week don't uh, fry any hardware So interesting story, uh, our, the hotel I'm at, which I guess I won't mention by name just because the morning I showed up had a stabbing in the lobby. <laughs> there was a stabbing <laughs> in your hotel? Uh, when, I sh when I pulled up, when my car came to drop me off, it was all police taped off. All the lobby, the front parking area, like the overhang where the, the people drop you off. And there were like evidence markers on the ground. Was this in Oakland? Know, to no, this is in Fremont. Oh, okay. Well, they get and, violent in Fremont too. Yeah, it was, and it was hilarious. And then there was like, there was like, there were like two chairs in the lobby and uh, one of them has like a big blood stain on it. And I'm kind of like looking around and I, I go in to check in and I go like, so something happened in here? And she goes, uh, there was a fight in the lobby. And I kind of like, I kind of like looked around and there were like people taking fingerprints on the glass doors <laughs> and stuff like that. Right. And I look around and I go, I don't think it was a fight in here. <laughs> she kind of laughed. And I, we found out later that somebody had, there was an attempted mugging, apparently. Attempted mugging. An attempted mugging. Ouch. When, so. uh, one year when management at Tech TV decided especially late to attend uh, CES or Comdex, I can't remember which one it was, we ended up at, at a place called the Blair House Inn, which rapidly became the Blair Witch House Inn uh, in our <laughs> vernacular. And it was one of those, it was a classy place. Um, 
efficiency rooms, kitchen in every room. And I got there on, on, on like Saturday before the show started and I stopped counting when I got to 473 cigarette burns that I could see from the couch, including the ones on the couch. It was like, it, it was, <laughs> you know, it, it was clean. I will say that there was just a lot of cigarette burns in the place and about three or four, and there's nowhere to go to. So we were stuck and, uh, I walk out of the place to catch the shuttle over to the LVCC. It's like 7.30 in the morning. There are nine police vehicles out front. And when I say police, there were uh, Las Vegas, like there were Clark County sheriffs, Las Vegas PD, two unmarked cars, um, the the uh, Nevada State Police, and I think like a postal police or something crazy like that. And half of them were canine <laughs> units. You know, and I, and I duck my head in the... Uh, to ask the manager who was who was a fan of Tech TV, the 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 night manager hadn't gone off duty yet, and I'm like, do I need to hide behind something solid? Is is somebody scary loose? He's like, no, no, no. When 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 you've got efficiency apartments with kitchens like this, you can run into a problem with the crankster gangsters cooking in your hotel rooms. So we let the local law enforcement train once a month with the dogs, <laughs> and that keeps the crankster gangsters at somebody else's hotel. And I was like, all right, so let's keep the meth idea. labs out that's, of anywhere I'm sleeping. That's that's an owner that is smart i like that guy extremely but it was a little unsettling to see like you know nine seriously outfitted police vehicles um parked out in front of the hotel <laughs> it's, it's always a little awkward when you're like am i gonna be able to get to my room do i need to put on some sort of you know booties to get through the lobby <laughs> <laughs>